Mr Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Now screw cutting on the lathe is an enormous topic. If you want a guide for the beginner have a look at Tubal Kane's channel. If you want process details for the professional machinist have a look at Joe Pysinski's work. Now I'm going to make no attempt to cover this topic in much breadth but based on comments I had on Pistons and Rods Part 3 I've decided to put a little detail together showing some of the aspects of my setting up. Now there's going to be several topics here and we'll kick off with a pictorial on the clipboard. Now topic number one is going to be aligning the cutting geometry to the spindle centre line to give you a nice properly aligned thread form and not a misaligned thread form as would result from some misaligned cutting geometry. Now this is going to be a live demonstration. I'll do it over on the lathe and I'm heading over there now. So commonly to set a threading tool you take your fishtail gauge, you hold it against a known reference and you manipulate your tool until you're happy with the angles, at which point you proceed and form the thread. Now that's fine, but what happens when the tool becomes that small that it's not easy to do that? For instance, if I hold my fishtail gauge on as before this time, the reference surface of the tool is that small that trying to accurately set an angle becomes a bit haphazard. Now you could improve the situation by using magnification or perhaps by adjusting your tool design so you've still got a nice uh, small end to it but you've got a much bigger reference surface that could be used to set the angle. So that's one method but here's another. So I'm here at the shadow graph, this is a hand ground tool and I have set the tool on the shadow graph stage such that the front edge is parallel to this line and uh, you get a bit of a funny effect when projecting a vertical face but it is parallel and what I then do is I bring my fishtail gauge over to the horizontal and do a bit of comparing. Now um, you could use a graticule for this but I'm just holding the gauge up and as I'm grinding this on the offhand grinder I just bring this over get one side right first then match the angle and get that spider out of the way and what happens is um, once you get your threading angle right you have also then got your threading geometry parallel to the tool body so the center line of this cutting geometry is parallel to the tool body so all I have to do on the lathe is present this tool body square to the work and I automatically have the cutting geometry presented nicely so to begin I have set the tool proud of the tool holder so that the front face is accessible. I'm installing that into the tool post and then I'm going to bring this over, slacken the tool post nut just with a little bit of tension and I'm going to set it so that the angle is backward of the face and then I'm going to come into my known reference surface which in this case is the um, drive plate and making sure everything's clean I'm going to wind in gently so the front of the tool is just making contact and I keep winding and watch this end kick round okay that's it that's gone solid that tool face is now flush up against this surface at which point with some pressure still remaining on the saddle hand wheel I'm just going to nip the tool post knot. So that is a method. It involves using a projector and a bit of messing around but it's all down to the reference surfaces and hopefully that all made sense. Moving on and in my video I showed the checking of a thread size by means of measuring over wires. Now what I've actually got here is three cylindrical gauge pins sat within the thread form and combined with the use of a micrometer this allows me to check what is referred to as the pitch diameter. It's my preferred way of checking external threads and you can read all about it in your machinery's handbook. Now threading wires appear to be something uh, UK model engineers really struggle to get hold of and I found a source, Arc Euro Trade sell them quite reasonably and I've put a link in the description to where you can buy some. Now when it comes to measuring with the really small wires here's a few tips. Now the checking of even a uh, comfortable sized thread like this can become a three handed operation. You've got to get your wires properly aligned, you've got to get the micrometer over the whole lot 
and you've got to find the sweet spot to get your proper reading not to mention having a camera tripod in between your legs now this becomes all the more difficult when you turn to a uh, fine thread like this this is a quarter inch by 40 18 thou wires and as some of you may have noticed i'm using a piece of packing foam to support the wires now this is just a sort of piece of high density foam and it allows me to just slide the whole lot over the thread and with very little effort i can come in and measure that now one uh, care point although it's nice and handy to push that right up so it really holds itself in place i avoid doing that because it tends to splay the wires out as you see there and uh, when the micrometer is then taking its measurement it's having to try and compress those wires back down and uh, you lose a bit of the feel down to the friction of the wires having to bend around now it may not have been obvious there but with small wires you can afford to be a little more unorthodox in your wire positioning i have the micrometer anvil shown in green the thread wires shown in blue and the thread shown in black now when i measured that bolt earlier i had one wire below and two side by side directly above now with smaller wires you can afford to spread out a little and make the measurement more stable. Now this measurement is more stable because I have enlarged the footprint over which the micrometer is working. If you had two 18 thou wires side by side you've got a pretty narrow footprint and the micrometer tends to be a little less stable. But to finish this topic I'll just say uh, this is the set I got from Arc Euro Trade. Uh, they are a little flexible and bendy compared to proper gauge wires but perfectly adequate for the model engineers workshop very handy and they are a much more versatile way of checking threads than your typical go no go gauge and uh, can be used for hundreds of different uh, variations now a quick point on thread form so you're using your wires to check your pitch diameter and it's all very accurate but here's a way in which your pitch diameter can be right and your thread no good here is my threading tool I've cut about three and a half inches of thread and I've just had a look at the thread form with my magnifying loop and I've noticed this nose radius has worn slightly and grown bigger. Now I've stopped at an appropriate moment and I'm going to take this to the offhand grinder and just tickle this face up to uh, make this more of a sharp point. Now that may not seem like the obvious thing to do and you may be thinking well it's a nice shape, it's sharp, it's got a rather attractive nose radius so what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. In a properly formed thread, the pitch diameter, as represented by these green dots, of the male and female threads are very similar. The geometry at the root and crest, however, is different. For example, this female thread has a smaller radius in the root than the male thread has in the crest. This leaves clearance and allows the thread flanks to take precedent in forming the fit. Now, as this tool wears, the radius produced in the female root enlarges and although it's probably not an exact radius a uh, exaggerated form would look like this so the radius has worn to a larger radius and the tool is now cutting a larger nose radius now if that radius was to wear significantly you could end up with the scenario shown in green so the female radius has worn all the way back to there but the male crest radius is properly formed and that is going to result in an interference represented by this green shaded area so although the pitch diameter is measured correctly upon assembly of the two threads this clearance is going to prevent the threads from uh, mating properly having said that there is still a way in which these two threads could fit together and that is shown here if you were to turn the pitch diameter significantly undersized the male crest radius would eventually fall within the female root radius. So your threads would screw together, but the thread fit would be very poor. So that's just a bit of an overview, and the key message is both the pitch diameter and the thread form are equally important when trying to get a good thread fit. Now finally, I have a little topic on work holding that I rather embarrassingly totally missed in my video pistons and rods part 3. It's an important detail, Knowing about it can uh, save you some heartache, so uh, here it is. When turning between centres, you typically have the component, the drive dog, and the drive plate. The spindle turns and turns the drive plate, which drives the drive dog, which turns the component, and that's fine. So what's the problem? Well, 
When screw cutting, the timing of the component in relation to the timing of the headstock and lead screw matters very much. And when I say timing, I'm referring to the rotational positioning. So once you've started screw cutting, this component's rotational position and the lead screw's rotational position must be the same every time to get a single start thread, that is a single spiral. So what happens if the drive dog comes away from the drive peg? Well, potentially, screw cutting, you're in trouble because you've started your screw cutting, say your 10 thou in, with the drive dog nice and firmly up against the drive peg, but through carelessness, it gets knocked away. And uh, let's do an experiment, see what happens. Okay, I'm going to start the machine. The drive dog is now no longer in contact with the drive peg, and as a result, you have affected the timing. The component to lead screw relationship has been thrown out. Now I'm going to be a bit naughty and just show you what would happen if you came to do some turning. Pressure would be applied to the component and the drive dogs caught it up. Okay, so perhaps not a major disaster but it could certainly give you a mess where the thread started, if not break the tool. So it's a very valid point. I have traditionally seen um, the drive dog retained to the drive peg using soft iron wire. Uh, a commenter suggested a flexible tape is a more modern alternative. Either way, when you're doing anything like screw cutting, uh, maybe an out of balance component, anything where the relationship of components to the lead screw really matters, it would be wise to retain the drive dog to the drive peg. Now, just as a side note, I did mention that obviously with a single start thread or one spiral thread, this would uh, have disastrous consequences. But I have heard of methods for cutting multi start threads, that's threads where you have multiple spirals around the same diameter, and actually using this theory to produce those multi starts. For example, if you were using a drive dog of this design with the leg on it and a four jaw chuck, you could set the component up, turn your first thread, then remount the component going one jaw round then remount the component going one jaw around and again and by the time you've repeated your threading operation four times you've got yourself a nicely spaced four start thread. Now I've never actually tried that myself but some food for thought. Well that's all for today. I've got to go and uh, cook some meatballs but hopefully you found something there of value and thank you for watching. See you on the next video.